This is start of something new, something different, something cardinal. Voice of Ultras is an initiative we took to educate the vast football community of India. We want the entire community to know about much lesser known facts and stories and history of football in Delhi. We want every last person in this community to know exactly how rich this heritage is of which they are a part of. From a long time, Delhi has been continuously criticized about lack of footballing culture and heritage. The truth is, the history and reality of footballing scene in Delhi has never been uncovered and brought out in light. So, it's quite easy to say such things without the knowledge. We Dynamos Ultras have taken the responsibility to find those hidden gems, those unheard of legends and those exhilarating glories that Delhi once had. We'll take you on a journey, Football Delhi. The journey starts from 1895 when the first club in the capital was formed through the turbulent times of partition to the hardships of this very day. We hope to have your company and support on this long journey on a hidden path which is full of surprises, glory, thrill and heartbreaks. To kick off this journey, we are graced by the presence of the Encyclopedia of Indian Football and the author of an inspirational piece of art, Barefoot to Boots, The Many Lives of Indian Football. Two of our very own ultras, Aditya and Dipesh, are in conversation with Novi Sir to start this treasure hunt of glories of daily football. Hello Sir, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to have you. How are you Sir? Yeah. How are you Sir? How are you dealing with the quarantine? Uh, Getting on, staying at home, quiet. Uh, reading, relaxing, <laughs> sleeping a lot, but surviving, that's important. <laughs> that's it, sir. So, sir, you contributed a lot to the football in India, and it is said that there's nothing about football in India that Mr. Novi Kaparia does not know. So, sir, tell us, how did you get involved with football scene in India, and what are your earliest memories of the football scene? Well, let's say my involvement is accident of circumstances that I was lucky to be born in Old Delhi in Kashmiri Gate area. Uh, that is, I was grew up in Chabi Ganj, Kashmiri Gate, which was the hub of football activity. If I had grown up maybe in South Delhi or West Delhi, I may not have been so inclined to football because I belong to the Parsi community, which really doesn't take much active interest in football. My interest in football grew because of the environment in which I grew up. As I said, I grew up in Old Delhi, in Kashmiri Gate, which was not a congested, overcrowded motor park hub as it is now, but then was a vastly middle class colony with many elegant shops and vast open spaces to play. There were the Kusha Gardens, the Nicholson Gardens, St. Stephen's College Playgrounds, Hindu College Playgrounds, which were accessible to local people. Where the interstate bus terminal exists now, the vast space was open play fields, which were meticulously maintained, and we used to go and play there. The New Stars Club, Khalsa Blues, they used to play hockey there. Uh, The two famous football clubs of uh, Old Delhi, of, uh, well, my area, Kashmiri Gate, Union Club and Young Bengal also played there. So growing up, as I would be walking around with my parents, I used to see people playing football. And it's unthinkable nowadays, but more people in the 50s and 60s in that area played football than cricket, maybe because football was a cheaper game and a quicker game. And uh, so I was gravitated towards football, played with my friends, then moved in and played in these 
open spaces, there were enough youngsters to play with. Uh, as you improved, you played, I first played for Union Club. And, uh, you know, we didn't have any of these fancy uh, licensed coaches and academies. Senior players taught you. Uh, you practice with senior players late evening or Sunday morning. They taught you the, you know, finer points of the game expertly. They looked after you. And uh, that's how we learned. We used to spend hours talking about the game. Uh, Union Football Club, uh, which was from the Morigate area, uh, was a club predominantly of the Muslim population. And in fact, when Delhi won the Santosh Trophy in 1944, there were two players from Union Football Club in the team, both forwards, Habib and Roshan Ali. And uh, okay. they were mostly, you know, people who were, uh, they were local butchers, tailors, shopkeepers, kabaris, uh, or in various small professions. They supported Union Football Club. The Bengal Association, just near the main Kashmiri gate, where the oldest puja in Delhi was held, they also had a football team, Young Bengal Association. So there was great rivalry between Union Football Club and uh, Young Bengal. A lot of the Muslims left after partition, but the club remained and the migrant population uh, they started playing for Union. I started also with Union Football Club. Later on played for Young Bengal. Uh, so we had two well established clubs who played in the local league and there's to be big rivalry yeah, between these two clubs. I remember one of the matches I was playing for Union and slightly rainy day, Young Bengal were excellent. Bengali players on a wet pitch, uh, they outclassed us 5 1. And, uh, you know, we were teased and tormented. Uh, there would be thousands of people watching those matches. And uh, so, football, as any youngster, you know, you were a local hero. Everybody likes to be appreciated, to be admired, to be pointed out. And football was the way forward. Absolutely. Parents didn't mind because it was healthy exercise. Uh, in the era I grew up, uh, there was no communal problem and things like that. People of all communities played together. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't far away from my house. You just walked half a mile or less to the ground and played. We mostly played in tennis shoes and... Uh, later on, of course, in football boots. Also, yes, there would be full-fledged matches. There were so many players. As juniors, you'd have to wait to get a chance. Or we play small five-a-side games nearby. As you improved, you played in the 22. Substitutes were made. So, you know, football became a way of life. And you just wanted to get better and better. And... After the games were over, we'd spend hours talking. Remember, it was an era, there was... What was our recreation? Sports or the cinema? You could either go and watch a movie or sports. There was no television, there were no indoor games, there were no video games. No mobile phones and all that. <laughs> Certainly <laughs> no mobile. We barely had telephones, so we had mobile. Basically, and, the sport was very accessible to the people, right? Yeah, and our major, uh, you know, in fact, in my book, Where Food to Boots, yes, several sir. of the things that I've written mm -hmm. are from anecdotes which people, we used to talk for hours on end after practice or a game ended. You took off, you sort of, you know, took off your first perspiration soap, jersey, uh, toweled yourself, got dressed, slight refreshment would be shared and people chatted. And we talked about football and Indian football. Please, I want to stress this. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> even <laughs> talked about Pele then. You know, now, I mean, rarely anybody talked about Indian football. Mm -hmm. I have a question to change that. 
Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we hope to change that the ease of access to the television and the European football has just changed it also. Yes, sir. So, um, so basically, sir, as we all know, football is not new in India. The oldest club being Young Men in 1898 and Mughals in 1905. Um, yes. Delhi Football Association being one of the oldest associations in India. So, um, we want to know about. its formation you know something more about this for its formation it was formed in 1926 and what were the events that basically triggered the formation of the so, association okay let me explain to you that a bit of an area of darkness in which <laughs> i think besides myself maybe one or two others nobody has done research uh, see young men and mogul as you mentioned yes uh, these were formed in 1898 1905 these were formed by local enthusiasts young men was again uh, the club formed by butchers in the jama masjid area at uh, the qureshi family and for generations uh, the same qureshi family sustained the young men and so they formed it so that the young people of that region would be actively involved similarly mogal after the historic mogal empire they formed another team uh, and now there was no association then so they were mostly friendly matches so after them came crescent uh, usmania uh, union football club and uh, simla young etc you know new newer and different clubs started coming up yes. they would play friendly matches with each other there would be local tournaments sometimes around about the festivals eid or diwali there would be small uh, tournaments for four or five days mm. with small cash rewards or basically uh, you know you got a uh, gift in kind so it was not organized but there were lots of football now the main event in those days was in 1911 you know the the uh, mohan bagan won the ifc shield as well yeah yeah that was of course uh, a big uh, what we say catalyst incentive yes. but more important the capital of in british india shifted uh, from yeah. calcutta to delhi yes, sir. okay yes, sir. and so red yes, fort sir. they occupied mm-hmm. so there would always be a british regimental team in red fort the british regimental teams see football was basically lower middle class middle class game the regimental teams the officers played cricket the tommies played football they didn't have any class bias they were very happy to play local indian teams mm-hmm. so that's how delhi football picked up these british regimental teams used to regularly invite local clubs to come and play against them and it became a big challenge to you know get a good result against uh, a british regimental team just like mohan bagan did against the mm-hmm. yorkshire regiment if i think once or twice young men or so do uh, you know it would be headlines in the urdu papers so you became a local yeah. hero uh, and they were tough matches because some most of the delhi players played barefoot moguls were the first to play with boots uh, the british were of course physically fit and all booted so those matches were very popular in the red fort grounds in the barracks there were some good football grounds and every month or so two three teams would be invited so that became an incentive and more and more teams uh, were you know keen to get that invitation to match the wits against the british team the officers were there uh, the colonel came with his wives and you know everybody was dressed in their splendor there'd be the regimental band so it became quite an occasion and that's how the popularity of the game increased the local press bengali as well as urdu would highlight these matches the local players became heroes 
and they would invite the British teams, regimental teams to come and play. But they were a bit hesitant. They did come sometimes. As I said, mm -hmm. the Stormies had no class ties. And so that's how football in Delhi grew. Then uh, Delhi teams started traveling outside. Allahabad, Dehradun, and places where Aligarh, where football was established, and other cities in UP, and started playing in tournaments. So gradually, a group of officials felt that it is time that we all get organized under one umbrella. Yes. And so it took some years, mm -hmm. five, six years to form the Delhi Football Association. Mohammad Zubair Qureshi, mm -hmm. uh, Sasoba Singh and uh, R.B. Sen of Young Men, Abdu Babu as he was known as. Mm -hmm. These were the three main people who organized football in Delhi, mm -hmm. and in 1926, they persuaded all the clubs. You said the big problem then was that uh, young men, Mughals, were the important things. There were newer clubs which had just formed. Now, when you have an association, it has to be democratic. Each one has one vote. Yes. So initially, yes. young men and Mughals were against that. They wanted the power of veto, but anyway, Things got tidied over, amicably settled. Mohammad Zubair Qureshi was a man of much stature, and all the clubs agreed. And so from 1926 onwards, we formed an association. Slowly, local tournaments started getting formed, which didn't sustain for long. By the 1930s, uh, a local league started, especially with the coming of Simla Young which was formed by government employees. You know, those days, the summer capital of the British Raj mm -hmm. was Simla. And yes, so the yes. people would go to Simla and they used to play a lot of football there in the summer months. And so they called themselves Simla Youngs. So they became the rivals of the old Delhi clubs. So that's how the Delhi League started in the 30s. And uh, young men and Mughals were very successful. Sadly, records got lost because all the officials uh, of that era mm. moved away to Pakistan. We do know that in 43 and 44, uh, the year 44, when uh, Delhi won the Santos Trophy, Mughals were unbeaten champions of the Delhi League. And in fact, Mughals were the most successful team in North India then. Uh, they won four tournaments. Uh, mm -hmm. all over North India, so they were obviously a very good team and as I will narrate, in the Santos Sophie team mm -hmm. uh, of Delhi, there were four members from Mughals, defender Munawar Hafiz, midfielder Afzal, midfielder Emma Hussain and inside forward uh, Anandi Negi. So Mughals were a highly successful team. So by the 1940s, the Delhi League was very well established. Uh, mm -hmm. From the beginning, it was very popular. It was played in the summer months. Uh, all these clubs, as I said, the local butchers of the Jama Masjid area, the Riyaz and area supported young men. So they would come out in large numbers. Mm -hmm. Mughals had their own group of fans in the near the Chandni Chowk Jama Masjid area. Uh, so local areas supported their own team. Simla Young said, people who worked for Government of India, Crescent had their own group of supporters. The Government of India press team who also had Hamid, a very good midfielder in the Delhi team. Government of India press was uh, located at Turkman Gate. They formed their own team because there were government colonies there. You see, credit to the British, wherever they form colonies, they form playgrounds. And mm -hmm. simple playgrounds. And so local people took to football in a big way. And that's how football spread in Delhi. And people like Mohammed Zubair Qureshi and Addu Babu, uh, they channelized this energy and saw that football became an activity 10 months of the year. Uh, we have to thank the local Muslim and Bengali population. It was they who inspired football in Delhi. 
organized football in Delhi, made sure the clubs remained disciplined. See, the clubs survived on local contributions. There was to be no great money. Mm -hmm. uh, people of the colonies gave contributions. Or some of the players, as they started earning, would contribute five rupees a month, ten rupees a month. So clubs survived on shoestring budget. Yeah. Uh, they basically provided you the jersey and the stockings and uh, uh, shorts. Uh, um, boots and all were, were their own. But the popularity increased because it was very competitive mm -hmm. and players practiced all the year round. The red fort area, it, there was no security problems then. That yes, patch of yes, green yes. in front of red fort was steaming with thousands of people of all age groups playing football. Yes, sir. and sir, that was my next question. Like, I, so first of all, it is very sad that the football in Delhi especially has lost that local connect that you were talking about. And to revive the football, that's what I think should be our next way forward. But in your book, sir, the Barefoot to Boots, um, you very well written that the Red Fort, the area in front of the Red Fort, it used to be the breeding ground for the champions. So, sir, can you please elaborate on that? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, see, the whole wall city area is congested. Yes. Uh, narrow lanes, house upon house. Where do young boys go? Every evening, Thousands would troop out, clutching a football, and unorganized matches, you just walked across and went to Red Fort. At that area, there were no policemen stopping you, wherever you found the patch of green, uh, bricks, or you took off your pullover or shirt, made small makeshift goalposts and started playing. Uh, the older people would act as, you know, dadus, guys and teach people. So that's how the popularity is, from quantity comes quality. And Mughals practiced there, some of the teams started practicing there. As I was growing up, I used to see the clubs playing for, uh, coming for the famous Duran tournament and DCM tournament. Also practiced there, the famous Gorkha Brigade, which won the Duran in grand style in 1966. Mm -hmm. Beating teams like Noel Bagan 2 nil, Mohammedan Sporting 4 nil, yes. uh, Leaders Club 4 nil. Uh, they practiced in front of uh, Red Fort. They stayed, they were an army team, they stayed in the barracks. And uh, every morning, Ranji Thapa used to tell me, uh, look at that team, Ranji Thapa, Bupinder Rawat, Amar Bahadur, Tikkaram, they were four internationals. Amar Bahadur was one of India's finest left fingers. They woke up in the morning from the barracks, had a cup of tea, and went and played uh, in the Red Fort ground as we would be traveling in our school bus. We used to see them on a Saturday or Sunday, when a holiday, one would stand around watching them or request to be play a little, and players were very supportive then. And as Andy Tapas often told me, what was their refreshment after tough practice two, two and a half hours, game, shooting, they'd go back, have a samosa and a two butter toast and a cup of tea. That was the only freshman they had. Uh, so Hyderabad Police, the legendary Hyderabad Police, uh, the first club to win the Durand when it started in Delhi. They stayed yes, at Kareem Hotel. They would often walk down to uh, the Red Fort area to play. Mm -hmm. So your heroes played there, uh, people came to watch them, then you tried to emulate them. Throughout the year, local boys played in the Red Fort area. It was unrestricted and it was very well maintained. Yes, during uh, a week or so before independence, for security reasons, it was stopped, which was fair enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, during Republic Day, yes. during that time for a week or so, the ground would be taken over by the army. But otherwise, there were no restrictions at all. And it was a boon for the overcrowded areas of Old Delhi. And uh, that's where they learned their football, learned to appreciate it, and talent came. City Club, which became a very popular football club in the 
1960s in Delhi, which was formed just after independence. A uh, lot of them started playing in the Red Fort, in the front of Red Fort. They were all boys, young boys from Anglo-Arabic school and local colleges. They were from a few, uh, you know, localities in the Jama Masjid region. They all mm-hmm. used to gather to play there. So it was easily accessible. It was not only Muslims, uh, Bengalis would come, uh, people of other communities would come, and uh, refreshment was easily available nearby. You brought it across to Chandni Chowk. Mm-hmm. You had often those famous jalebis uh, in hot milk in the winter. So it was a very popular pastime. I used to also go and play there. And uh, you played with people of all communities. There were no restrictions. Yes, sir. Uh, beautiful thing indeed. Maybe if we would have had more grounds right now, we would be a better city in terms of football. But sadly, yeah. we do not. Um, so, sir, you mentioned that we won the Santos Trophy in 1944. The only time we won it as far as I know. Um, sir, can you tell us uh, more about the winning run we had in that tournament? Like we beat, uh, in, like we beat the Bengalis 2-0 in the final. We beat many other strong teams. Can you please tell us something more about that? Uh, yes, certainly. First, you very good observation you made. It's basically ground. The Indian football is warped at present. We only think of academies. Yes. First, you get people playing unless you have play fields and which are close to home. Which are accessible, you know, by accessible everyone. Accessible and close to home. Yes. Sir. I could walk from Kashmiri Gate to Red Fork or go in a bus which cost me five pesa. Old Delhi people could walk across or come on cycle. Now, if you go to an academy, your mother or father or mm. a chauffeur has to take you in a car. Mm. So only the upper middle class play. So and the fees, the fees of accessing those academies and those grounds. Absolutely. So we need more play fields. That is very important. And let the youngsters play and enjoy the game. We just enjoyed the game. Gradually, those of us who got better, we got fine-tuned. Many of my friends just played and left. Everybody didn't aim to be a football player, but it was just great fun. You know, participating, hmm. running, tackling, trying to win a match, joking, taunting. And afterwards, you sat and enjoyed with each other. Now, the Santos Sophie started in 1941, hmm. uh, which was, again, a lot of effort by the All India Football Federation uh, to, you know, have a national championship, which was a very good idea and justifiably the first uh, year it was held in Calcutta, which is always the mecca of Indian football and Bengal trounced Delhi 5-1 in the final. Uh, Bengal was then as it is now a uh, very formidable team. 42-43 uh, because of the war years it wasn't held. Uh, 1944, uh, Delhi hosted it. And uh, Delhi uh, hosted it in October 1944. Remember, the war is petering out then. It was then known as the Delhi Football Association Limited, BFAL. And now to choose the team, there were a few trial matches between probables and possibles at the end of the September. The local league would finish by September. Mughals were champions and uh, they were trial matches. Mm -hmm. And as happens often in India and in local associations, there was massive infighting, nepotism and, you know, each club official trying to get his player in the team. Mm -hmm. Now, the captain decided was Osman Jan. Usman Jan had already won uh, the Durand with uh, Mohammedan Sporting in 1940, the Calcutta League. So he was a legend. In fact, he's such a legend that in Pakistan there is even a tournament 
named after him, Usman Jan Memorial Football Tournament. He's one of so the he best goalkeepers in Asia and South Asia, as you have mentioned in your book. Yes, certainly, certainly. And uh, uh, Usman Jan was shocked, aghast, because he had, uh, you know, grown up in an area in Calcutta, I mean, played his football there, where, you know, merit mattered. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, who I mentioned, the Union Club player, Roshan Ali, very skillful inside forward, mm -hmm. a brilliant ball control. He was the one who instigated Usman Jan that let us protest, otherwise we will make a fool of ourselves. So Usman Jan, he retired from Mohammedan Sporting, come and taken a job in Delhi. He used to work at Army Headquarters. Now he took a half day leave and he went to the secretary, Mirza Saib. Uh, Mirza Saib. And he started complaining about the selection of the team. There was a very talented Bengali uh, outside left called Babani Banerjee. And Babani Banerjee played for uh, ND Heroes and uh, ND Heroes then didn't carry much clout and so he was dropped. Uh, Osman Jan delivered an ultimatum. He says either Bhavani Banerjee plays or you choose another goalkeeper. Hmm. I mean, he said words to the effect, okay, look, Mirza Sahib, either select Bhavani or you look for another goalkeeper. There's no compromise. So Mirza and all were flawed because, you know, dropping, Uthman Jan was like, say, dropping MS Dhoni in his prime, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and there were also some Englishmen who played. Uh, English was the center forward, his name is English, short, stocky, but very quick, he was with the Royal Air Force. Yeah. And Delhi had an excellent defender called Tony Miller of the Royal Air Force. Tall, six foot two, you know, an old fashioned British center half, commanding in the air, hard battler. As the Santos Trophy was about to begin, he got transferred. You know, the Royal Air Force transferred him, and he was very sporting of him. He cycled up to Osman Jan's house early in the morning and said, Sorry, boss, I am not available. Osman Jan was shattered. That you know their best defender is gone. So, using all these circumstances, he forced the selectors to choose a team of his liking, in which there were four from Mughals, two from Union, two, uh, and then from Crescent Club, Young Men Club, Government of India Press, the Royal Air Force, New Delhi Heroes, and Simla Youngs. Now, the opening match was against United Provinces, which is basically Uttar Pradesh, the opening first round match. At half time, Delhi was trailing by one goal, and uh, UP, they had a very good defender called Kallu Khan, who later on played for Mohammedan Sporting. Uh, he was a rock like, impregnable Great Wall of China in defense. And uh, yeah. Delhi was just passing, was all astray. And Hamid of Government of India Press, who was the main midfielder, was just not being able to distribute as was Afzal of uh, Mughals. Now, Usman Jan was again shattered. Mm -hmm. His great friend used to be another former Mohammedan sporting player called Akil Ahmad. Akil Ahmad had played for Mohammedan Sporting as a centre half. Mm -hmm. Then he also left. You see, people they, they didn't get paid much, so he needed a job. So he came back to Delhi and joined All India Radio. Mm -hmm. uh, Akil Ahmad was a very good football player, and uh, uh, Akil Ahmad also grew up in the area near the famous Kareem's restaurant, and was quite a hero in that area and uh, Kareem used to feed him for free because he was the star footballer. So, Akil Ahmed went up to Osman and said, see, the team is not clicking, it's a bad day at office. Tighten your defense and rely on counter-attack. 
try and save the day. He was very astute football player, and well, they did that, and uh, finally Delhi equalised midway through the second half. Habib of Union Club centered cross from the right. Kakkar K G Kakkar, who is you know quite a legend in Delhi sports, uh, he was an international football referee and an international hockey umpire. He played football yeah. for Delhi and hockey for Delhi. Hockey for Khalsa yeah. Blues. Uh, football he used to play for Simla Youngs and uh, companion clubs. So uh, K G Kakkar uh, and Bhavani Banerjee both reached the ball. Babani said, "Mine, Kakkar dummied and took Kalu Khan out of position, and Babani first turned the ball into the net, and that was one all. And Osman realized that Akilan uh, Ahmed's diagnosis was right. They played out a draw, and then on the replay, uh, Delhi reorganized themselves and uh, won two one. Uh, uh, Banerjee scored again." And uh, uh, in uh, the equalizer, and also the uh, second goal. So, Bengal, uh, Delhi was through to the semi-finals. So it was a bit of good fortune, uh, yes. just like the Indian team mm -hmm. had in the '56 Melbourne Olympics. Uh, in the semi-finals, Delhi was to play Bombay. Uh, Bombay was a formidable team. There were seven people of the Royal Air Force and other players from local teams there, Caltex and all. But because of the war and the tension, you know, the Bombay and naval rating and the naval mutiny and the Quit India movement, uh, somehow they couldn't feel the team. So Delhi got a walkover. So, creditable, they reached the final, but basically winning only one match. Now, in the final, they played the legendary Bengal. Star studded team, even then, the great Sharlan Manna, one of India's all time great defenders, uh, Mohan Bagan captain, Padma Shiri. He and Sarat Das were defenders. Sarat Das an Olympian. Uh, Aparao, Noor Mohammed Jr., Anil Day, uh, then some Anglo Indians, Livingston. They were an outstanding team and had won both their matches by four to five goals. Bengal's only problem was uh, complacency. They thought they would walk away in the final. Mm -hmm. Now there's a story going how far it is true or not. I've narrated it in the book. Now, it is true, but how much does it really affect the players? Uh, Delhi officials arranged for the Bengal team to visit Kutub Minar on the morning of the match. <laughs> Kutub Minar was a great attraction. Yeah. You know, when you stayed in Delhi, you stayed in Old Delhi, so everybody saw Red for Jama Masjid, Chandni Chowk, mm -hmm. you went to Billa Mandir and all those places. Uh, Kutub Minar was far away. Mm -hmm. uh, Strongers were arranged for the Bengal team, and you know those days people slept early, woke up early. So Bengal said, "So what? You know Delhi is nothing to worry about." So they set off for the Kutub Minar about 7:38 in the morning after breakfast. So the Bengal players, you know, uh, sort of uh, they. Mm -hmm. Initially, they didn't think they would climb up, but they had a, a you know, carefree attitude and overconfident, brimming with overconfidence. And so they decided, let's go to the summit. It was a magnificent view. You got a bird's eye view of the whole of Delhi. There was no pollution and all then. But it took its toll. You're climbing narrow staircases. Going up seven stories, then coming down. It's all right if you were there for a picnic, but then you're playing a football match at four in the afternoon. But Bengal felt they could take it in their stride, 
uh, they ate something there and then came back and the Songas had a small rest and went to the ground. Uh, the ground was uh, what is now the major Dhyanchan Stadium, National Stadium, where the first Asian Games was held in 1951. Mm -hmm. It was then known as the Royal Oven Amphitheater. Mm -hmm. And it was packed absolutely, completely, you know, Lord Irwin Stadium uh, it was then, mm -hmm. and uh, 70, 80,000 people gathered over there, and the chief guest was uh, uh, Field Marshal Sir Claude Auchinleck, Commander-in-Chief of the British Indian Army, and all the British royalty, I mean, uh, important officials were there. And Bengal, as expected, started dominantly. Uh, mm -hmm. See, there were local referees. Uh, the referee was Himayat Ali. He mm -hmm. was a sports teacher at the local Raisina Bengali school. Mm -hmm. And Bengal was dominant. In the first half, Usman Jan's experience and some excellent defending by Munir of Mughals, uh, Hassan, Ahmad Hassan of Mughals, Punnu of young men, Afzal of Mughals, mm -hmm. who later migrated to Pakistan and even represented Pakistan in the 1954 Manila Asian Games, kept Bengal at bay. Osman Jan made save after save. He was a, uh, you know, inspired match. Now, this, they say the climbing of Kutub Minar took its toll. If Bengal had maintained the same tempo, Delhi would have cracked. Second half, the legs got heavy. The legs got weary. The passes went astray. Delhi came into the counter-attack. And Bengal's playmaker, Anil Day, and they had, as I said, some outstanding playmakers, Anil Day, Dip and Sen, they started tiring. And Aparao kept giving passes, but they couldn't break through. And finally, Delhi took the lead. Bhavani Banerjee, who was probably Delhi's outstanding player, mm -hmm. uh, he later in life, he worked in a, as an accountant in a petrol pump uh, near the Goldakhana area. Uh, he ran down the left flank and crossed and Goalkeeper K. Datta of Bengal, he seen very little action. So it often happens the goalkeeper who's, in, uh, who's seen little action is not so alert. He misjudged the flight of the ball, and English, the Englishman, mm -hmm. uh, he came in at the far post and steered the ball into the net. Against the run of play, Delhi were one nil up. The crowd went berserk. The cheering was non-stop. Bengal became vulnerable. And within minutes, Delhi scored again, uh, this time Roshan Ali, uh, Roshan Ali of Union, very crafty, one of the finest ball players on the subcontinent. Roshan Ali took a swerving free kick, and Banerjee again, you know, made a diagonal run from the left. The free kick was from the right. Sarat Das and uh, the great Manna were marking the center forward. Uh, you know, they were marking uh, English who scored the goal and Anandi. They didn't see Babani Banerjee coming in and Babani Banerjee uh, got the rebound and volleyed into the net. And 2 nil, and Bengal was heartbroken and Delhi defended the last uh, 10 minutes and emerged victorious. So it was a meritorious win because the Delhi team played very well and not to concede the goal as Bengal is, is miraculous. But as I said, they were fortunate they didn't have to play Bombay in the semi-final. Yes, sir. <coughs> I guess, sir, like they say, fortune favors the brain. Yes, certainly. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so, so that was an absolutely beautiful description of the match. I don't think that there can be any record found of it anywhere but this but for the way you said it, I think I just living the match. Thank you for listening to the part one of our podcast about the history of daily football with Mr. Novika Padia. 
In the second part of our podcast, we'll discuss more about the players of that great Delhi team that won the Santosh Trophy in 1944, and we'll know more about the football scenario in Delhi after the independence. See you next week.